Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In today's video, what we're going to explore is the concept of inflation. So goals for today, first of all, is going to be to define inflation. What exactly do we mean by that? And then from there, we're going to look at how we track inflation, how we're going to measure the cost of living and changes in cost of living. We're then going to take a look at uh, understanding the costs and benefits of inflation and really why we might want to aim for low levels of inflation over time. Finally, we'll take a look. We'll summarize all this by taking a look at a brief history of Canadian rates of inflation and what, uh, what we're sitting at right now here in Canada. Okay, well, without further ado, let's jump over and let's start taking a look at what exactly we mean by inflation. So... By inflation, what we mean, let's write that down. So inflation, often in macroeconomics, we utilize the symbol pi to represent inflation. Now, for those of you who have taken micro before, or maybe they're in the process of taking micro, you might recognize that, hey, in microeconomics, we said that profit was equal to pi ah right we have a bit of crossover here you're like well which one is it well right now we are studying macro not micro so yes in micro profit is often utilized as pi but here we are in macroeconomics and inflation is going to be notated as pi so okay that helps us for the notation side but what exactly is inflation well, what inflation is, is the percent change in the average price level. So I'm just going to go price level. And again, if you're like, oh, what's that triangle little guy there? That's again our Greek letter delta. That just means for a change in. So that is we could work out our percent change. We could go, okay. What is our price in year one minus our price in the initial year all over the price in the initial year? This would give us our inflation rate as a decimal. If we want it as a percentage, we would need to go times 100. So this is how we can calculate it if we're going, say, looking at the price level in 2001 versus 2002. Well, if we had our price levels, we could work it through in this way here. If we were looking over a longer time frame, maybe 2005 versus 2010, so we're looking over a five-year time period, and say we have this price level, and we have this price level, and we want to figure out, hey, what was our average inflation rate over that time period? Well, in that case, we need to use that compound growth formula that we had before, and that is that we would say inflation is going to be equal to the value at the end, V1, so that'd be our 2010, all over the value at the beginning, V0, in our case, that'd be whatever value is for 2005, all over 1 over N minus 1. So if we're doing it over multi-year periods and we want to figure out, hey, what was the average rate of inflation over this five-year period? Well, V1... Here, let's give it some context. Let's say in 2005, we had a price level of 105. In 2010, let's say we had a price level of 112. We have a five-year period there. We would work that out as 112 over 105 to the one-fifth power minus one. Working that guy out would give us our rate of inflation. So let's just quickly calculate that. Make sure we're all on the same page. So 112 over 105, all of that raised to the one-fifth power. That gives me something like 0 0.0. Ah, we're going to go 13. It's actually 1299, so 0 0.013 or 1.3% if we want to express it as a percentage rather than a decimal. So the other way that we could calculate it in this case here. Right, in this case here, because we had the five-year period, this was our average annual rate of inflation as prices went from 105 to 112. So, okay, that's the idea of inflation, that, hey, it's the percent change in price level. Well, 
how exactly do we go about tracking the price level? How do we go about figuring that out? Like, where does this number 105, where does this number 112 even come from? Well, one way we can calculate this is actually with a unit, with a metric we've already taken a look at, which was our GDP deflator. Right, in that case there, we held prices constant and we exchanged our level of output at each time. Well, we can utilize that as a measure to say, okay, how is that changing as we move through? Really what we want to take a look at is more to evaluate our cost of living and really the change in prices of stuff we buy day to day. And that is typically what we want to utilize to measure inflation is going to be our consumer price index. This is also known as the CPI. The consumer price index and the idea behind the CPI or the consumer price index is we're gonna get a basket of goods right so we'll throw hey a loaf of bread maybe two apples a lemon uh, maybe some potatoes right we'll throw a bunch of stuff into this basket of goods and then we'll say okay we're gonna keep buying the same basket of goods every year so we're gonna buy the same quantity year after year after year we're going to take a look at how the price of this basket of goods changes as we move through time. And then by working out how the price changes, we can then figure out by how much prices have changed and figure out a price level. So let's see how exactly we do this. And we're going to start off by defining it in kind of our math speak. So to do that, we're going to say CPI today is going to be the summation of the price today quantity in the base year all over our summation of the price in the base year, the quantity in the base year. We then want this as an index around 100, so we're then going to multiply times 100. So, okay. We have some math speak, probably looking at this, scratching your head going, okay, that's ugly. I have no idea what to do with that. So let's take a look at an example as to how exactly we would figure this out. So for this example, let's suppose we're looking at a very simple basket of goods. We'll have a list of our items here. And let's say our list of our items are cheeseburgers. Let's say we want to know what, how the price of cheeseburgers has changed. Uh, we're going to also throw into this basket some cola and some french fries. Hopefully you're not too hungry when watching this because uh, maybe you'll find yourself maybe skipping some dishes for some McDonald's or something. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to track how these prices have changed. And let's say at the start we're dealing with 2010. That is 2010 is our base year. And so what we're dealing with is the price of cheeseburgers, cola, fries. And then we also want to know how many we bought. Right? How much, how many cheeseburgers, how much cola, how many fries did we buy as we were in this period? So let's take a look. We'll put price in dollars here. And cheeseburgers, let's suppose in 2010, it was a dollar for a cheeseburger. Uh, let's suppose a cola was a bit more money. That was something like a buck fifty. And French fries, French fries were two fifty. So we have our prices going on there. And let's suppose that, hey, at a dollar, you bought five cheeseburgers. Similarly, you bought three colas and you bought three french fries. So what we want to figure out is our total expenditure in 2010. So to figure out our total expenditure in 2010, that's just going to be the summation of price times quantity. That is, hey, how much did I expend on cheeseburgers? How much on cola? How much on fries? sum it up. So, hey, in that case there, price 2010, quantity 2010, 2010 being my base year. So, okay, that's just price base times quantity base. Hey, that's this guy here, price base, quantity base. So what do I have? One times five? Oh, that's not too bad. That's five. Three times a buck fifty, that's going to be 450, right? And again, our total expenditure is in dollars, prices in dollars, quantities are units, so total expenditure dollars. Three times 250, that's going to give me 750. 
So take the summation of all my price times quantities, right? That's what that is, summation of all my price times quantities. So let's see here, that 50 turns the 450 into a five, five and five is 10, 10 and seven is 17, is my total expenditure in 2010. Okay, fast forward. We're now in today. Let's presume that today we're living in the year 2015. And we'll have then, of course, our price again in dollars and our quantity. So let's say that our prices have changed a little bit, right? Prices aren't constant. They change as we move through time. And so now all of a sudden the cost of cheeseburgers is $2. The cost of cola, oh, maybe some new technologies made cola more cheaper to be made and the cost of cola has fallen to only a dollar. Meanwhile, French fries, ah, French fries are going up in price. So what we see, right, looking through this with our basket of goods, some goods are getting more expensive. Some goods are actually getting cheaper. And this is what we actually witness year over year. Certain goods fall in price. Other goods actually get significantly more expensive. Also, as we move through time, typically we don't keep our consumption baskets the same. As the price change, so does our quantity. But hey, so does our income. So does our taste. So does our preferences. So does society, right? So quantities are likely not constant as we go through time. So let's say that, hey, in 2015, let's say, ah, price of cheeseburgers has gone up, but I'm, I still, I'm really liking them. I'm still going for five cheeseburgers. Even though the price has doubled, I'm still consuming five. Cola, uh, maybe I'm not so much a fan of all the sugary drinks anymore. That's dropped a bit from three to two. And French fries, again, let's presume that that's dropped. Again, they were three. Let's say that that has dropped now down to two. Let's work out what my total expenditure now is in 2015. Again, that will be in dollars. And if we think about this, my total expenditure price times quantity in 2015, 2015 being today, well, that would be price T times quantity T. And then I'll take the summation of that at the bottom. So, okay, two times five, that gives me 10. Ah, that's two, that's six. So 10 and 16, 18. So, okay, we see that, hey, we've had a slight increase in our total expenditure from one period to the other. But, okay, what are we doing with this number? What are we looking for? We're looking for price base, quantity base. Okay, we have that right here. And then we're looking for price today, quantity base. Oh, that means we don't actually want this. This actually is has nothing to play in our calculation of inflation. And let's talk about why that's the case. The reason why we don't want to include this, and let me just, you know, essentially put a little faint red line through that to say, no, 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 we don't want that. We don't want to include this because our quantities have potentially changed. Right? So because our quantities have changed, our basket of goods has changed. What we're wanting to measure is for a fixed basket, a fixed quantity of goods, we want to track those prices through time. So in that sense there, what I want to figure out is I want to figure out my price today times my quantity in the base year. Right? And that's what I have in my numerator here, price today, quantity base year. So that is to say I want price today times quantity base year. Price today, quantity base year. Price today, quantity base year. So how exactly does that work out? Two times five, well, that still gives me 10. Okay, one times three, well, that's gonna give me three. Three times three, well, that's, that's gonna give me nine. So what do I get in this case here? 10 and nine, that's 19, 19 and three, that gives me 22. So, okay, what do I have? I had 17 as my total expenditure, that's how much it cost me to buy this fixed basket of goods in 2010. That same basket of goods would cost me 
$22 five years later. Notice significant appreciation compared to this basket of what we were actually buying in 2015, right? Our taste preferences, all of that changed, causing a change in our basket in 2015. But hey, we can't have both prices and quantities changing if we want to measure a change in price level. So in order to truthfully measure a change in price level, we have to hold our quantities constant. Okay, how can we figure out CPI? Well, our CPI today, so hey, what was today? We said today was 2015. So our CPI in 2015 was the summation of price today quantity base. Okay, price today quantity base summit. That was that. All over the summation of price base quantity base. Price base quantity base. Take the summation. 17 and then times 100. So, okay, what does that work out to us, or for us? 22 over 17. 22 over 17 times 100 gives me. 129.41. Okay, great. So that's a nifty number. What exactly does it tell us? Well, on its own, not much. What we need to rationalize, what we need to realize first is what the value of CPI was in the base year. So that is, hey, we set the base year equal to 2010. So if we went and calculated, the CPI in 2010, well, that's going to be equal to, hey, keep in mind, if we set today equal to 2010 and the base year is 2010, well, then, okay, price base, quantity base, we know that's going to be 17. Price today, quantity base, well, price today is 2010. Quantity base is also quantity 2010. So price 2010, quantity 2010, hey, that's just again going to be 17 times by our 100, and we get our indexed value for our base here to be 100. And again, that shouldn't be a surprise. Anytime we're dealing with an index, the base year of the index, whichever year we pick to reference, that base of the index is always 100. As we move up, as we move forward from 100, well, the value typically climbs and we're dealing with a growing number. If we ever end up below 100, that just means that we had a period where we would have had deflation in that case. That is where the price level was dropping year over year. Okay, so how exactly can we figure out the rate of inflation, right? If we wanted to figure out the annual average inflation rate, how could we work this out? And again, Maybe the knee-jerk reaction would to be to do 129.41 minus 100 all over 100, and you'd get something like 0 0.2941. That is 29.41%. You're like, wow, that's a massive percent change in inflation year over year. Yeah, yeah, that is a massive amount. But keep in mind, that's not year over year. That would be how much prices have changed over a five-year period, 2010 to 2015. If we want the annual average rate of inflation over this five-year period, we can't do this. This only works if we were doing, say, 2010 to 2011. If we're doing multiple years, we need to use that compound growth formula. And that is we can find the average as value at the end. 129.41, value at the start, 100, all over the power of 1 to the n, so 1 over 5, minus 1. And in that case there, we work that out, and what do we get? We get something like 0 0.0529. So that is about a 5.29% average rate of inflation, if we were to calculate it that way there. Okay, so here we've done a quick little example. We've introduced our CPI formula. We've utilized a table. We've seen how to calculate CPI from the table. We've then said, okay, here's the value of CPI we calculated. 
our base year would always be 100. And then we've utilized these values to figure out our average annual rate of inflation. So quite a bit going on there. To be honest, we'll be utilizing inflation, that is this final value, and interpreting it quite a bit as we move through the semester. This whole calculation of CPI won't be as important in, say, in an exam situation. That is not to say, okay, great memory purge, let's walk away from this. No, 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 I can guarantee you, you will see questions like this on the midterm and final. It's just not going to be a significant part. So it's not a memory purge item. It's definitely something you need to commit to memory, something you want to practice in the quizzes to figure out how to do, but it's not going to be a major part, right? Just being able to calculate some numbers for the sake of it, I'm not too interested in your ability to do that. Computers can do that great. As we carry on in this course, right now we're still setting these foundations. As we carry on in this course, I'm going to be interested in your critical thinking skills and your ability to evaluate or analyze the situation. So that's really the interesting stuff we're building up to slowly, right? It's really going to be after our first midterm that we finally get there. Okay, so that's the idea behind consumer price index. The reality is a little bit different, right? This is a bit of a simplified case. That is, in reality, Statistics Canada, when they measure this, well, they're figuring out for their basket of goods that a typical consumer buys, they're looking at things like spending on food, spending on shelter, spending on household operations, transportation, recreation, clothing, alcohol, cigarettes, cannabis, health products. So, okay, here's, here's the interesting bit. How many shelter did you buy? last year versus how much shelter did you buy five years prior? How do you measure how many shelter, right? How, how does that work out? So <clears throat> in reality, it doesn't quite work out in this kind of quantity base. Instead, what happens is they take their items, they figure out the average price of the items, and then they weight them. They put a fixed weight on these items as you go through and they say, okay, let's say 16% of a typical Canadian's income went towards food. And then on and on and on. And so, for example, if we wanted to take a look at this as to how they do it, we would have our items. And the big items we would be looking at would be food, shelter. I'm going to abbreviate this to household operations, so household ops. We're also going to be taking a look at transport. So just transport for short. Ah, you're spending on recreation and reading and uh, those kind of situations. Clothing and footwear. What else do we have here? We have alcohol, cigarettes, cannabis. I'm just going to leave that as ALCH, alcohol. And then finally, on health and education. The weight which Statistics Canada currently assigns to these is something like 16%, 27%, household operations about 13%, transportation is about 20%, recreation is sitting at about 10%, clothing at about 5%, Alcohol, cannabis, and cigarettes is about 3%, and health education is about 5%. Now, those of you who are maybe a bit sharp and taking a look at that, you might notice this doesn't add up quite entirely to 100%. That's because I rounded these in order to display them as nice percentages. As a result, right, some of these might actually be more like 13.49, 20.49, so, hey, they technically round down to 13, round down to 20, but between the two of them, I just lost a percent, right? There's a few cases like that. So it's close to 100, but it is a bit under, if I recall. Again, just rounding for me to make nice numbers here. Okay, so that's the idea, is that in reality, they weight our average income or how much of our income goes towards each of these things. And then based off of these weights, holding these weights constant, they take a look at, okay, how has the price of food changed given our weight spending on food? Shelter, on and on and on and on. Okay, 
Some problems with CPI. CPI is not a perfect measure of our cost of living. But that being said, that doesn't mean it's something to throw away, right? There are issues with it. We acknowledge there's issues with it. It's not a perfect measurement of inflation, but it does the job pretty decently. And just because these few issues, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So what are these? Well, first of all, these weights, right? And we saw this too in this previous case, the quantities in which we consume can change quite drastically over time. That is, right, if we looked at CPI over a long enough time period, well, once upon a time in this consumption bundle would have been horse. Not horse to eat, I guess that's not really a good place to put it because all this stuff was food, but underneath transportation, right? Long, long enough ago, horse and buggy was a primary mode of transportation. At some point, you had to substitute that out and you had to change the weights according to that. Household operations. Well, hey, as we got cheaper and cheaper use of energy, as we got more and better use of durables, our amount of income going towards household operations began to fall. Same with transportation as cars and automobiles became cheaper and cheaper, right? So these weights change over time, meaning that from time to time, we need to update and readjust these weights. Now that in brings in an inherent problem. There are statistical methods they go through to change these weights while still getting a pretty accurate estimate as to how things are changing, but it does bring in some air. It does bring in some uncertainty. Some other problems, right? Some other problems are, hey, this is the, what they presume is the typical bundle, but does that necessarily match your bundle? Maybe. Maybe, and this is true for quite a few Canadians actually, maybe your shelter expenditure is closer to 40%. Well, hey, if that's closer to 40% and shelter is growing faster than all the rest of these, their measurement of CPI is going to be very different than your actual cost of living, right? Than your actual consumer price index. So, ah, there's a problem with that, right? There's a problem that your bundle uh, your bundle may not match. That is, depending on what you end up consuming as an individual, you might find that your cost of living is either accelerating faster than the national average, or maybe given your cost of living, given your bundles that you consume, it may be actually increasing at a slower rate. Sometimes it might actually be decreasing depending on what your bundle is. So, Yes, we come up with this kind of typical expenditure, this typical weighting, but keep in mind, that's not everybody, right? That's not everybody there. So it's not necessarily representative of any one individual. Some other issues. How do we deal with substitutions or changes? Right, and we kind of talked about this already and this whole idea that, hey, horses have been replaced by automobiles by vehicles. How do we deal with that substitution? How do we deal even more so, right? That one's pretty, I shouldn't say obvious, but hey, clearly a horse is not the same as a car. But what about something a little bit more subtle? What about something like, hey, a new car in 2010 versus a new car in 2020? Are those the same thing? New car, new car. You're like, hey, yeah, yeah, both of them are new cars. But keep in mind what was included in a new car in 2020 versus what was included in a new car in 2020. Sorry, I think I said 2020 there. I should, should have said in 2010 versus 2020, right? Very, very different vehicles. Much better fuel efficiency. Typically, these now have like little touch screens, Android Auto, Apple Auto built in for you to stream your music. Sometimes they have built in Wi Fi. Power everything is typically standard. Versus in 2010, having Wi Fi in your car? What? A touch screen in your car? Hooking your phone up? How, where, why do we be doing these things? Right? very different in what these vehicles actually were. Right, and you do the same kind of idea about, well, what about just something as simple as a cell phone? 
in 2010 versus a cell phone in 2020 or a computer for that matter? Are those actually the same thing? Even though we will call them a cell phone, a cell phone, even though we call it a computer, a computer, they're fundamentally different. Phones today, computers today are drastically faster, drastically more powerful than they were 10 years ago, exponentially so. So again, there's methods that Stats Canada uses to adjust for this, to compensate for change in quality, change in performance, change in what's encountered in that. But again, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. So through all these attempts, right? Attempts are made. Honestly, they probably do a pretty awesome job. I, right, I can't even imagine the process that they go through with this. I've looked through the reports as to what they do. It's mind-numbing what they work through into doing this. What it's estimated is that they're saying, yeah, okay, we have these problems and more. We are introducing air. We are introducing air into the CPI. And what this is estimated at, they estimate that they, they estimate that they overestimate inflation by about half a percentage point. So that is, hey, if they work out due to the change in CPI from one year to the next year that we had a 3% inflation, uh, that 3% inflation might actually be overestimated by 0.5 or up to around 0.5%. Meaning true inflation might have only been 2.5. Might have been. Or hey, maybe they actually got it knock on that time and it was actually 3%. Right? That's the problem with an error. You don't actually know when it does or when it doesn't apply. So typically the belief is that CPI is overestimating inflation. But again, right? We're not 100%. We're not 100% on that. Just kind of our best led belief. Okay, so that's our idea. We've introduced CPI. We've taken a look at some reality of CPI, some of the problems with it. Let's, let's talk about inflation itself. And that is inflation itself. Is it good? Or is it bad? Right? So, hey, prices increasing year over year. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Ah, what's going on with it? Well, the answer, and this is a true economist answer, the answer to that is that it depends. And the reason why it depends is that, well, at high rates, at high rates, okay, it's very likely a bad thing. If we had 100% inflation, probably going to have some problems there. Heck, even if we had 20%, 15% inflation, we probably wouldn't be too happy. But if we had low, constant, predictable rates of inflation, yeah, that might actually be okay. That might actually be a good thing even. So let's, let's talk about why that's the case. And in order to talk about why that's the case, let's start off by looking at a ridiculous scenario. So let's say that you wake up on payday. So it is payday, always a good day. You wake up on payday and you notice that you got double your paycheck. So hey, normally you only had $1,000 put in. This time you had $2,000 deposited into your account. And you're worried, oh no, did they make a mistake? But no, don't worry, they didn't. This is your new pay. You're now getting twice as much every paycheck, every pay period. Whoa, that's awesome. Your pay just doubled. But as you go out into the world around you, you find that also all prices, every single price has also. Okay. Are you better off? Are you worse off? What is going on? Well, in this scenario, you're really not better off or worse off if we just strictly were dealing with, hey, your paycheck versus prices. Sure, everything now costs twice as much, but your paycheck has also doubled. So in relation, there's really no difference. Cost twice as much to get a cheeseburger, but you make twice as much money. 
So, right, that cheeseburger as a proportion of your income has remained the same. You're no richer, you're no poorer as a result. So, in this case here, hey, doubling your paycheck, doubling all the prices, we've just witnessed 100% inflation. That's insane. That's hyperinflation. And we just said, hey, yeah, no, there's no real problem there. Everything just doubled. All rel Everything's in relation. Relative prices are all remaining the same. Hey, we're cool. We're good. Okay. So here's the problem. Typically, economists would say, well, typically we would expect that this would eventually be the outcome. If we had witnessed 100% inflation, we would witness a doubling of paychecks. We would witness a doubling of prices. Problem is, we would witness this eventually and on average. So that is across the entire population. Some people's paychecks would have more than doubled. Some people's paychecks would not have doubled. On average, they would have doubled. And eventually, on average, they would have doubled. There would have been some time until that happened. Same thing with prices. Some prices would have more than doubled. Some prices might have actually decreased. But on average, prices would double. And again, eventually, that would happen. This is where we run into the problems, right? This is where we get into problems with inflation. If prices jump first. Well, now all of a sudden you're poorer until you get that negotiation, until you get that fight with your boss to get a doubling of your paycheck. This eventually, until you get your paycheck to double, that hurts. That sucks. What if prices double on average, but although prices have doubled on average, all the stuff that you buy actually quadrupled? Well, Hey, right, that was kind of the problem we were looking at where, sure, this is how we calculate our average price level and thus inflation, but that's not necessarily what you consume. You might consume higher proportions of certain things. So based off of that, you might be disproportionately hurt by this higher level of inflation. You might also be disproportionately better off, right? So that is, there's some problems that go on because we have this kind of slow, arbitrary, average redistribution of prices and wages and all of that. And these really are going to get at our costs of inflation. Costs of inflation. And okay, what are these costs? Let's start off with our first guy here. Our first one is an unintended redistribution. And let's talk about this unintended redistribution. So first of all, hey, first of all, this unintended redistribution, this can be along the lines like we just took a look at that, hey, typically speaking, wages are slow to adjust. They're definitely slow to adjust downwards. We already talked about downward wage stickiness in our unemployment video. But even upwards, they're not necessarily the most rapid. Typically, wages are only negotiated once, maybe twice a year. And so in that case there, it's going to be, hey, CPI was released showing we had huge inflation last year. Now you get to use that to negotiate your wage. That is, there's that at least six month to a year lag in change in price before you see a change in wages. Entire unintended distribution, redistribution of income and wealth. All of a sudden, all these wage earners are significantly poorer, significantly finding it more difficult to meet their day to day needs. This is especially true for people earning minimum wage. Now, here in BC, we have this interesting case where all of a sudden, in the last five years, our minimum wage has skyrocketed. But if you look at it over time, Minimum wage stayed relatively constant. That is, minimum wage stayed being like 825, 825, 825, 825. Although that minimum wage stayed the same, all of our prices 
all of our prices began to rise, meaning people who are earning minimum wage were actually seeing a decrease in their purchasing power year over year. That is, we would say their real wage had actually fallen. The amount of things they could buy with their income was shrinking. That's really important with minimum wage. With your typical wage for most income earners, hey, there's that year lag, but you can renegotiate with your employer being like, hey, look, there is a 10% expansion of prices. You earned more because, hey, you got to charge 10% more. I need a 10% raise just to stay where I was at. And you can negotiate that in six months, a year's time. Minimum wage set by the government, ah, that's depending on political appetite. Sometimes we go years without a change in minimum wage. And then all of a sudden, as we saw in the last five years or so, we saw a boost in the minimum wage. So often these minimum wage earners are severely hurt by the slow erosion of inflation. And especially with high rates of inflation, they're hurt even more. So the same can be said for anyone on a fixed income, right? Anybody on a fixed income that's not inflation adjusted is going to be hurt by that. Okay, second thing, part of this unintended redistribution, uh, let's stick using the same color of white there, is that this is going to especially hurt people who hold cash. Right, and that is if we go back to that example where, hey, all of a sudden all of our incomes doubled and all of our prices doubled, and we said, oh, yeah, you know, not that big of a deal. Well, actually, to anybody who held their wealth, a whole bunch of their wealth, their net worth as cash, they're going to be hurt by that. If prices all of a sudden double, their wealth, it was just cut in half. Right, their $20 of cash that they had that used to be able to buy $20 worth of stuff can now only buy $10 worth of stuff, essentially, right? If you think about that in the real term. That is, if they used to be able to buy 20 widgets, they can now only buy 10 widgets for that same amount of money. So anybody holding cash, they're gonna be significantly hurt by inflation, and especially high levels of inflation, because it's eroding the value of that cash. Even though it's not holding cash, it causes an arbitrary, I shouldn't say arbitrary because we do know which direction it goes, but it causes, I should say, an unexpected, if we have unexpected inflation, an unexpected redistribution between savers and borrowers. And let's take a look at that. Let's suppose that you were a saver. And let's say that you were saving your money and you were expecting a 5% rate of return. And in that, you were expecting you were expecting the inflation rate to be 2%. Well, what we can do is we can invoke what is known as the simplified version of the Fisher equation. And what the Fisher equation does is it, uh, it relates our nominal interest rate. That is, hey, I'm expecting my money to grow at 5% per year. It relates this nominal interest rate to our expected inflation rate in order to get an estimate as to our real interest rate. And that is our real interest rate is the actual growth of my purchasing power. My money is growing at 5%, but the value of my money is decreasing at 2%. So what is the increase in the actual amount of stuff I can buy? The Fisher equation is represented as the real interest rate equals the nominal interest rate minus our expected rate of inflation. Or if we know that rate of inflation, that is if we're not looking forward and expecting an inflation, it would similarly be, so in this case here, what do we have? We're earning a nominal of five, we're expecting inflation of two. That is I would expect my savings to be growing at a real rate of 3%. That is by saving my money, I'm increasing my future purchasing power by 3%. Okay, so we have this expectation. What happens then if suddenly 
I'm still saving at 5%, but this isn't what inflation turns out to be. I have an unexpected change in my inflation. And inflation is now suddenly 6%. Well, what happens? I was expecting 5 I was expecting a return and nominal interest rate of 5%, my money to grow at 5%, and it still does, but my money devalues, depreciates at 6%, meaning that my increase in purchasing power in this case is going to be 1%. Meaning, by saving my money, by saying, hey, you know what, I'm not going to eat all my cookies today, I'm going to put some money aside and buy those cookies tomorrow, by making that choice, I'm actually getting fewer cookies tomorrow. I'm losing out. My number of cookies is shrinking because I chose to save my money in order to forego some of today's satisfaction. That's a problem, right? That caused this artificial redistribution. This artificial redistribution. I shouldn't say artificial, sorry. An unexpected redistribution, right? All of a sudden, I'm losing when I was expecting to gain. On the flip side, we have the same scenario for a borrower. So for a borrower, let's suppose you're looking to borrow money and you sign a contract to say pay 7% for your loan. Again, you have an expected rate of inflation, let's say of 2% meaning that your real interest rate, your real cost of credit, as it were, was 5%. That's how much money, hey, that's how much extra you're having to pay. That's your true price of the loan, your loss of purchasing power by consuming it today rather than just waiting and consuming it when you had the money, right? Well, again, we can do the same kind of idea. We could say, hey, interest rate of 5%, Oh, sorry, no, no, not 5%. We're doing a different scenario here. 7%. And in this case here, again, inflation turns out to not be our expected two, but it turns out to be six, an unexpected change in our, in our inflation rate. In this case here now, my real interest rate is now 1%. Hey, from a borrower's perspective, I'm pretty happy about that, right? I was expecting to have a real cost of credit, a decrease in my purchasing power of 5% by taking this loan, when in fact, I only see a 1% by doing so. So what this does, an unexpected jump in inflation, it artificially, I keep saying artificially, I don't know why that word stuck in my head. It unexpectedly hurts savers, makes them worse off, but makes borrowers better off. So it redistributes wealth, in this fashion, away from savers towards borrowers. So unexpected inflation causing an unexpected redistribution of redistribution of wealth by changing our purchasing powers. Okay, so that's our first kind of cost of inflation. Unintended redistributions. Our next one. Two. The next ones are shorter. We're not going to be spending as much on the next one. The next one is blurred price signals. Blurred price signals. So what's going on in this case? We took a look in the previous video when we were talking about economic growth and we were taking a look at, hey, firm's choice of which technology to adopt. We saw the importance of relative prices. Well, here's the problem. If we're having high or volatile rates of inflation, these prices are changing quite a bit and they're changing in unpredictable, unexpected ways. If that's happening, it's very tough to tell what the relative prices are. It's very tough to get a clear signal as to, well, which good should you go for over another good? In this case here, it blurs the market. It makes it difficult for markets to clear. It makes it difficult for markets to actually hit equilibrium. The entire workings of that free market, that supply and that demand, they will no longer rapidly adjust to equilibrium. They will slow down. That slowing down of adjustment will cause either shortages, right? If given a 
relative price difference. So all of a sudden, we have too low of a price. We have excess demand. That will lead to a shortage. If we have too high of a price, well, then we're going to create too much stuff and we're going to create excess. So we find that, hey, if we have high inflation or volatile inflation, which typically goes hand in hand, this creates a real blur between these relative prices, a real kind of friction being thrown into our markets and their ability to adjust, meaning they cannot reach equilibrium as quickly, resulting in excess demand. We're going to be short on some goods. And then even though we're short on these goods, we're going to be producing too much of these other goods, right? These price signals are not aligned. That is, we will not be allocatively efficient. We are not, we are not allocating our resources in an efficient way. We are misallocating our resources, putting wrong resources in wrong industries, right? We're putting too much resources in this one, not enough in the one with the shortage. And prices normally are the thing that direct us, but these are all a mess because of how fast they're changing. So that's our problem there. Right, if you want a real life example of that, take a look at some of the literature coming out of Venezuela or previously out of Zimbabwe or way back out of interwar Germany, right? In these cases of high inflation, places just stop posting prices. Right? Oh, how much is it for a price of bread? Right? You have to ask that and you have to figure that out in the moment. It wasn't, oh, there, price of uh, bread, a loaf is $5 a loaf. Okay, I'll buy it. No, no, no. You had to go through this whole ordeal, right? Which is an extra friction in order to figure out the price because nothing was listed because they changed too frequently. That uncertainty just slows the adjustment of markets. Okay, final one. Final one is that it creates problems with long term plans. Problems with long-term plans. And what kind of problems do we have with long-term plans? Well, it goes something like this. You want to go and you want to create a new factory, right? You want to build a new factory. So you're trying to source out, hey, what's going to be the cost to build it? But hey, this is going to be a big project. It's probably going to take me four years to build. So what's it going to cost me in the first year for labor, materials, etc. versus what's it going to cost me in the fourth year? Well, First versus fourth year, only a three-year difference between those two. But yet, if we have really rapidly changing prices, that's really going to influence the cost of this development. Increases, actually inserts a ton of uncertainty into your planning. So what we end up witnessing is that, hey, when we have high levels of inflation, when prices are changing rapidly, businesses, consumers, people in general are less likely to commit to long-term commitments, long-term plans. People are less likely to sign for long-term loans, long-term purchases, same with businesses. They're less likely to kind of develop long-term plans because the future is just so uncertain. And again, why? Because prices are so uncertain. We don't know what they're gonna be in two, three, five years time. So as a result, planning investment slows down. And again, that hurts the economy. That hurts everybody overall. So some big costs of inflation. What about benefits? Is there such thing as a benefit of inflation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would actually say, we would actually say that we could actually make a case for a benefit for inflation. And that is to start off, there's no real benefit to hyperinflation, right? Venezuela, Zimbabwe, interwar Germany, just to name some of the big cases. There's no real benefit there, right? That level of hyperinflation, that just causes problems. But many argue that low, stable inflation is beneficial. Right. And again, you might be like, oh, what's this symbol going around here? Again, Greek letter pi, we use this to denote inflation. So low stable inflation is beneficial. And why? Why is this argued? Well, the big reason why this is argued, and if you haven't watched that last video on unemployment, you'll have to really go back and watch that to understand, is that low stable inflation helps overcome our sticky wages. 
That is, if you recall, if we have this negative demand shock or even a negative supply shock such that, actually I guess it would be a positive supply shock, sorry, such that wages are being pushed down. If you have some event happening that wants to push down wages, well, we find that wages are downward sticky. Workers, laborers, they resist this downward pressure. The result of this is excess unemployment. We call that cyclical unemployment. And then that cyclical unemployment decreases our output and then causes problems associated with that. A benefit of inflation is that it erodes your nominal wage. That is, hey, if my wage was $10 this year an hour, and then my wage next year was still $10 an hour, but inflation was 2%, well, technically, I'm earning less money next year, right? Even though you're like, well, wait, what? $10, $10. Technically, my wage fell, right? Hey, we're kind of eating into the sticky wages. We're allowing wages to fall a little bit, getting closer to equilibrium, getting rid of all that excess unemployment. And by allowing wages, nominal wages to fall due to slow, consistent inflation, we can quick, I don't want to say quickly, we can in a more faster fashion, but right, still not fast. We can approach that equilibrium, that downward equilibrium, if needed, in a more appropriate fashion. That being said, hey, if we don't have this downward pressure, if the economy is booming, well, hey, wages can still grow. Wages can still go from 10 to 11. Hey, that's a 10% jump in our wages, even though we're still witnessing an inflation of 2%. Right. So, hey, in that case there, we witnessed an increase in our real wage. So, hey, we'd still win in the case where wages are growing at all. But when wages are stagnant due to, say, economic stagnation, due to that recessionary output gap, slow, steady inflation helps to overcome this sticky wage problem. And that's seen as kind of the benefit of inflation. OK. So the video this far, what have we gone through? We've introduced inflation. We've introduced it as, hey, it's the percent change in prices over time. We took a look at our consumer price index. We measured inflation with our consumer price index. We used that table. We figured out, okay, how we could do that in theory. We then moved on and then took those changes in price to calculate inflation and then took a look at how Statistics Canada actually calculates their CPI. Well, not actually, but it gives us a bit of an insight into the process of. We talked about some of the problems of CPI, right? That there's not perfect, that it's not a perfect estimate of change in price level, and that it actually may over may overestimate inflation. We then finished off looking at costs of inflation, looked at the one kind of little benefit of inflation, and that really wraps us up for today. If you have questions about what we covered here, please feel free, post in the comments below, post on the frequently asked questions, shoot me an email if you have questions about what we covered. If you want to stick around, what I'm going to jump over to next, I'm going to jump over to some actual data from here in Canada and taking a look at kind of what our CPI inflation has done over the last, I think, 20 years, if I recall how long my data set goes back for. So. If you want to stick around, the screen's about to jump to white, so brace yourself for that. If you're in a dark room staring at a dark screen, it might be a shock, but here we go. Okay, so here we have, from our consumer price index, we have listed a whole bunch of different goods. So hey, that's our CPI for all items, just food, shelter, household operations and furnishings, on and on and on and on. That is, if I take a look at the CPI for food, it's really not all that interesting. I can go like so, and we just see, hey, it's trended up. So between 1970 and 2020, so sorry, I have 50 years worth of price history here. I believe 2002 was our base year, so 2002 should be about 100, which, yeah, that kind of lines up with what we're looking at here. So we see, hey, price of food has just slowly risen over time. You see in little periods it went up and then it dropped like in the 90s. Same thing in the mid 2010s, but general upward trend. 
Okay, not so interesting. What we really want to take a look at is what the percent change year over year is of food. And that is we want to take a look at this. There we go. We want to take a look at this inflation rate of food. And what we witness is something very different. Although it was trending up over time, we witnessed that, hey, in the 70s, in the 80s, we were witnessing at times 20% year-over-year change in food. Down to a few years later, a drop in the average price of food, back up to 20% change year-over-year, year, right? Extremely volatile in what's happening with the price of a basket of food year-over-year. We fast forward and into the 90s, and this will be a common theme. As soon as we hit the 90s going forward, we'll notice that a lot of our prices begin to kind of stabilize. The 90s going forward, prices kind of stabilize. They hover at this low, constant rate of inflation. Okay, let's take a look at all items. So kind of this is our full CPI, our full estimate as to, okay, inflation of all of our goods over time. So, okay, what's this guy do? We see, right, and again, just like I said before, we have, let's make this bigger. That's, oh, where did it go? Where did it go? Maybe that didn't work. Okay, let's not make it bigger. It disappears. Okay, so we see through the 70s and the 80s, we had 12%, just a little bit higher, 13% inflation. Uh, some years down to 5% inflation. That's quite a drastic change year over year in the price level. And then we see going into the 90s, we fell to about four. And then come 1990 onwards, we find that it was kind of more or less relatively banded, right? Got a few times up high, right? A little bit high there in the early 2000s. But typically, it didn't really break above three. And only in the case of big recessions, 08, 09, our recent pandemic here, only in those few cases did it break below zero. That is, since 1990 here in Canada, we have maintained a relatively steady, predictable, low rate of inflation. This is ideal, right? This was the argument we made that we would want to help alleviate the issues of new sticky wages, to help with our downward adjustment in the case of recessionary output gaps. What would happen? Well, we'll get into a lot of discussion about that. It turns out in the early 1990s, the Bank of Canada adopted a policy of inflation targeting that they wanted to maintain a rate of inflation for the country between 3 and 1%. And you see that generally speaking, since 1990, they've done a pretty good job. We've had the few exceptions that we've broken above. We've had the few exceptions where we've broken below. But typically, we've maintained that band. That is, typically speaking, we've been able to say, hey, I know that next year prices are going to be about 2% higher than they were this year, typically. Sometimes they're a little bit more, sometimes they're a little bit less, but we're aiming for that 2% year over year, which yeah, they've, done pretty, they've done pretty well. So that's our all items. Taking a look, right, we can break it down. We can take a look at just goods. So purchase of goods over time. We see, hey, our goods, same kind of idea. Massive changes in prices, very volatile too, through the 80s, through sorry, through the 70s, through the early 80s. Come 1990, we see that hey, our goods on whole, more steady. We have had our drops, 0809, recent pandemic, right? Mid 90s, dot com crash. A few other cases where goods have shrunk, right? Hey, goods becoming cheaper. That's not necessarily a bad thing as we move through. What about services? Well, if we take a look at services, our services, again, 70s, 80s, big percent changes, even going into the 90s. Going forward, we see a lot more stable still, right? Sometimes as high as four. They always stay positive for our services here, but more stable for our percent change in prices. So altogether, what we witness here, of course, there's more items we could take a look at. We can take a look at shelter. This will be our last one just for the fun of it. And we see for shelter initially a big spike. And then we see that, well, for a long time, it kind of yeah, stayed pretty close to zero. Boom, we witnessed a large year-over-year -year percent change. Dropped and then kept growing. Yeah, kind of what, around that 5 6% year mark. 
2008, 2009 financial crisis, and then averaged about eh, three to 4% year over year going forward as a cost of shelter. So we have that there. Again, another insight as to how certain goods, how certain parts of our CPI have changed year over year. And we see that, hey, even though shelter in the early 80s was as high as 16%, well, that wasn't true for the whole CPI, right? CPI in the early 80s, again, I said that was the last one. Let's just go back to compare. CPI in the early 80s was only about 12%. So, right, as we go into the different subgroupings, some things outperform, some things underperform. Okay, that last bit there, that was just to hopefully give us some contextual background as to what's happened in Canada with our inflation. A brief kind of introduction there that, hey, our inflation rate has been targeted since the 90s pretty successfully. And just to kind of, like I said, give us some context. If you do have any questions on that, anything in this video, of course, please feel free to reach out to me as through the methods I've already gone through. Thanks. Hope to hear from you next time. Bye.